What's up, all Power Ass crew? What are we doing today? Da da. Get the gears out, getting all the prep work done. We'll show you guys how to make setup bearings, a setup uh, pinion nut, and clean that sucker up, pop out a couple seals and stuff like that in preparation of new ring and pinion. Let's get it. In our previous video, we installed the locker. I'll put the link down below. But today we are installing 373 gears. So before you put your ring gear on, you want to take a little bit of brake parts cleaner. Make sure this surface right here is impeccably clean along with this right here. You know here where your bolt surface is, make sure those are super clean. No oil debris down inside the holes. You get the point, you need to clean. So you can do this a couple ways. You know, some people will take their ring gear and put it in the oven to make it super hot and it'll press on. But you can take, put your bolt up through the carrier Put your gear on and line up a bolt. Get that one started. And go 180 out from that one. Get that bolt started. About 90 from that one, which will be about right along there. Then 180 degrees out from that boat. Which will be on that one. Ah, uh, what the heck. Let's throw them all in. Basically what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take my lightweight impact gun and go around to all these bolts and pull this gear in place. But whenever you go starting them out, you want to hear, here and alternate side to side. So you pull the ring gear onto the carrier evenly. And I have taken all the bolts and everything, sprayed them down with brake parts cleaner, cleaned them up real good. Therefore, I've got no oil residue because later on, when we go to torque these down, we're going to put red Loctite on them so they don't go anywhere. Right now, I'm just spinning them around to make contact. And as you notice, each time I make contact, the next bolt beside of it gets loose. And that's because little by little, I'm pulling the ring gear on to the carrier. So just keep walking around it. I'm not going to bore you guys to death watching me do this, so I'm going to go ahead and get the ring gear pulled up onto the carrier, and I'll be back with you in a moment. Okay, I'm just about there. Now, how do I know that? Because as I come around, keep going, I mean, you see how I'm doing, I'm just, that's all I'm doing, just little bumps. Each time I tighten up one of these bolts, the next one beside of it gets loose, and as I keep making that circle, that's pulling the ring gear up on the carrier, as I mentioned a moment ago. But there will come a time to where the ring gear is on the carrier. So now your bolts aren't coming loose at all. See, before this bolt kept coming loose, the next one around, now they're all tight, which means a carrier and my ring gear are now one. So now that we got the ring gear on the carrier, take your bolts out. Because we can't leave them like this, we gotta put Loctite and torque them to specs. Y'all got some bonus footage on this video. I got the ring gear installed, and look right there. That's what I mean by the cross pin will hit the ring gear. So if you've got 373s, 410s, 456, whatever, if you've got 373s and numerically higher gears, 
you're going to have to pull the ring gear off to get the cross pin out. The more you know. Now I also ordered this. Now I also ordered this Dana 30 rebuild kit, which comes with your seals, and uh, you got your oil slinger right here, more uh, axle seals, shims to set all your clearances and new bearings, brush for the marking compound, and we got some red Loctite. I need that red Loctite. Brush your blade, cut it out. Squeeze it out like that. And it cuts the parts out as you need them. That prevents anything from getting lost. So take the red Loctite that comes in the kit. So here's the red Loctite that comes in the kit. Pop the top. Twist the top. Ta-da! Now we have a hole in it. Which is good. We actually want the hole in. So... I think you both put a little line on it right there. That's all it needs. And do the rest of them. And now we'll take my little impact and just run down to the touch. Then we take our torque wrench, do 25 pounds all the way around, then 50. Come over here and show you something. Now to help yourself remember where you started, where you stopped, that hole right there, that's where you knock out the roll pin. Use that for your first one, go all the way around, then you can keep track of where you're at. Now I've already done the 25, now we're doing the 50. You don't need to make the video long. Now these two bearings right here, they go on this. But you do not want to go ahead and press these on to your carrier. Why? Because you've got shims that goes right here and even on the other side. That moves this carrier and ring gear back and forth that establishes the gap between your pinion and your ring gear. But wouldn't that be such a pain to take this right here, press it on there, discover you got to move move some shims pull the bearing right back off move some shims around press it back on we're not going through all that hence me going to the auto parts store and buying another set of bearings they're about 20 bucks a piece roughly depending on where you get them from but what does that got to do with anything so i'm going to take this inside make it just a little bit bigger to where it will slide right over the earth there i don't want it to be like loose but i want to just gentle gentle pressure to be able to push onto that Therefore, whenever I want to establish my shims, how many I need on one side, I can keep pulling this on and off to establish my shim count, which you will see later. But as for right now, I'm going to get me a sanding drum and get inside this right here and open it up just enough that it slides on that right there. And matter of fact, I got two of these I got to do, so yeah, there's that. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to take that bearing, sanding drum, get inside and keep going around and around, running it until we get it just big enough that it slides onto the carrier. Just big enough that it slides onto the carrier, okay? So, sand it a little bit, check it. Sand it a little bit, check it. Because you don't want it too big, it's going to mess with your settings. I'd really prefer to have a wheel cylinder home to do this, but guess what I don't have, so I'm going to improvise. Oh, another thing, my carrier is like back there behind me, and I'm like good, I don't know, eight ten feet away from it i don't want all this dust get, get blown into my carrier so and after you get that done wipe your carrier off or wipe your bearing off get all that metal dust because i don't want it on my carrier at all and once i'm completely done i'll actually take brake parts cleaner and clean the whole bearing up to make sure it's completely clean so i'll come over and check it on the carrier Nope, not yet. A little bit more. Now let's go over what we had to do for the carrier setup. Just make life easier on you because you're going to have shims up inside here to space out your bearings. You want to push them on, push them off, and it's just a pain in the tail. 
inside this right here notice we got a little bit of a grip it's because i took whatever i done with it what was old grinding uh wheels inside there nope. close but not that one oh yeah that thing i had that inside there just go like right there and kept working with it working with it until i get this it slides on and off no problems because you gotta have to set your shims up to move your carrier back and forth to set your backlash and your gears where they mesh on and off. So that makes life easier. I got a set for this side and a set for that side. And just to be thorough so I don't have to mess up my new bearings, not only did I set up about the bearing itself, but I also got a new set of races. And I'll mark them on the box so I don't get them mixed up with all my new parts. So I used LM501314, LM501349. Bearing and race, these go together. The race goes beside the differential. That prevents you from messing up all your new stuff. Because I've got brand new Yukon bearings and gears and all that fun stuff. So there's that. And there's also a race for the pinion. Yeah, here it is. Notice the grinding marks right here and notice I marked that. I put this on the bell sander, kept turning and turning and turning this down smaller to where this is going to go into the housing of the differential. Because remember when we knocked out the uh, that big washer looking thing, then you had those little shims behind it? That's this race here. So your, your shims are going in behind this, but you want to push it in with the shims, tighten up your setup nut on your pinion here and check your pinion preload. If you've got enough, you're good to go. You know, you get your spacers and your a shim set up right. At that point, you put your new one in permanently and lock her down. So that's what we're gonna do for the setup. So I'm, on this video here, I'm showing you guys how to tear it down, what to do with your bearings to set all this up. You see this slides on side there for the carrier. This, I'll show you in just a moment on the extra diff yourself so you know what's going on. Just so you guys know what to do and get ready for the install, which will be the next video. So here's your housing. The, here's the setup spacer. And between your spacer, you're going to have this, except a new one that's not beat up. And you'll have a certain set number of these shims right here. We'll have to determine that when we do the install. But you'll be, if you don't make you a setup brace, you'll be pulling this in and out. Until you get your uh, preload set up right for your bearings so this right here makes life a lot easier you just kind of slide in place and set, uh, check your preload if it ain't good tap it back out because it's super loose and you're good to go so get your setup bearings done first and in the next video we're doing the install for the gears and there it is 1991 yj if you guys are on my channel much you know that jeep well so here's what happened see that right there that rear end mm -mm. that's not a dana 35 no more that's an, actually an 8.8 .8. after my second Dana 35 going under. I decided no more. I was tired of swapping rear discs. So I threw in the 8.8. .8. But here's the problem. The 8.8 .8 is geared to 373. The front axle is 355. The two together makes the transfer case very unhappy if you put it in four-wheel drive. Don't do it. So how do I solve this issue? I regear the front. Somebody's gonna throw in the comments. I'm gonna go ahead and cut you off. No, I don't want to regear the rear end right now. That does have the limited slit 373. I would have preferred the 410, but guess what? I didn't find one, so it's 373. I'm not regearing this thing to a 456 or 410 or anything like that right now because I just simply don't want to, don't want to put the money into it at the moment. So I'm regearing that to 373. So when I swap that gear to 373, it matches that gear right there. And guess what? I put my transfer case in gear and well, I can go play. Yay! First thing we got to do, get it jacked up on jack stands, get the wheels and tires off, and brake systems and all that good fun stuff. Now, I'm not going to video for removing the brakes, removing the axles, and all that kind of stuff like that, because I've got tons of videos shows how that's done, and I'll link those up down below in the description so you guys can check that out. There's really no need in making this video any longer than it needs to be. When you get your brake caliper off, set it on the leaf spring if it works fine for you, hang it up by a zip tie, shoestring, paracord, whatever. Above all, do not let it hang from your soft line because it will damage your soft line and you don't want to do that. So set it on your leaf spring, zip tie it up here, whatever you got to do, but make sure you got no tension on that soft line. 
sweet focus check the brake caliper off 12 millimeter socket and to take the unit bearings out 13 millimeter 12 point 12 point I almost said I got really country didn't I once you get your bolts out for your unit bearing more times than not you just get your hammer or something like that smack it on the back side of the hub here it'll pop them out or also where is it at Well, some unit bearings actually have a little divot right into the edge right there to where you stick a screwdriver and pop them out. But either way, most of the time they're not too hard to come out. This right here is already moving. You don't have to worry about pulling your axle out of the hub or unit bearing because the axle and everything will pull out of the tube. Right here is your central axle disconnect, the CAD. It's got a collar inside there, which you guys will see this later in the video. Uh, that axle shaft will slide out of that collar it'll drop the collar down inside there but don't worry about that right now we'll take care of that later because i'm putting I'm getting rid of uh can't see it i'm gonna get rid of that vacuum thing right there and i've got a uh, posi lock i'm putting in now be prepared you might you might you might get a little bit of oil coming out the end of your axle tube so if you're really picky about your garage floor or something you might want to put some under the axle tube to catch it in the event that it does Here's what I mean by screwdriver access. Some of your unit bearings actually has that little divot right there. You can get a screwdriver back in behind it and work your way around it, break it loose. So, just wanted to show you. I realized the driver's side had that little area, so I wanted to show you. Once you get the unit bearing bolts out and that's broke loose, just pull it on out. Ta da! Another thing you can do as well, your unit bearing bolts, leave them out like that a little bit. Make sure you got about three threads engagement going into the unit bearing. And you tap that with a hammer, oftentimes they'll unseat this right here. I'll give you guys a little tip. Before you take and pull this cover completely off, drain the fluid out of it, go around it and just break them till they're, just break them loose. I've already went around it once and broke them loose and they all should be pretty much finger tight. So what you wanna do is start coming around it and loosening your bolts. Don't pull them all out at one time. Just back them off about four turns or so. And what I need to do now is, ah, there we go. And now once you start got fluid going, back your bolts out a little bit more, a little at a time. Therefore, they'll let your fluid come out of your differential slowly instead of splashing everywhere and you get a big differential grease bath. I bet y'all can sm smell this stuff through the camera, can't you? Ain't nothing like differential grease. Luckily, this stuff's not burnt too bad, so it don't stink as bad as it could. Now you see there, no grease bath. Makes life a lot easier. Okay, let's just get that cover on off. So I took a little bit of brake cleaner right here and sprayed up inside there, got all that nasty grease out of there so it'll be easier to work with, much more clean to work with. And the tie rod is all in the way. I'll probably just take the tie rod, break it loose from right there on that knuckle, and I'll zip tie it up to the drag link right here and get it out of my way because I'm going to be taking that in and out quite a bit. And it will be all up in my way. Then you take this one, just pull it on out. And for those of you who don't know, there's a collar up inside it, which I'll show you in a minute, that goes over the end of this right here. There's a vacuum actuator laying there, 7 16 size socket, gets that out. And here is where it all goes. I did the hose clamp trick. I hear the comments, I can hear the comments. I don't know why you do that, that's so stupid, that don't work. Dude, that's been in there for almost five years. Yeah, it works just fine. 
So now here's that collar. This slides off. What happens is your actuator slides this thing right here back and forth, which locks it between this spline here and the spline on the stub shaft that we just took out. You see how the splines are engaged into it. And what the clamps were all about is that this thing sits in a certain position which engages both the stub shaft and the axle shaft. Well, I keep calling it a stub shaft, it's the other half the axle because your stub shaft is actually that right there is your stub shaft. But the other half of your axle that goes up inside there, the collar keeps it engaged. But by putting those clamps right there, which I'll link the video up where you guys can actually see how I did it, it prevents that collar from sliding all the way over. So therefore, it locks your axle here and the other half of the axle locks them together on a full time basis. Yes, it runs just fine. I've had it like that for many, many years. So those of you who are all concerned, oh, I don't want to do that, or that's dumb, or whatever, no, dude, it works. Just chill. So, anyway, we need to take that out. And let's see. That will slide on out this way. But, I've got a camera in one hand, but you guys get the point. You just grab hold of it, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And ta-da! Look at yonder. See, there's your splines where it engages into your differential. And out here. Right there's the other part of it. So slide it right out your knuckle. And my hand is covered with the grease. Now I gotta touch my camera. I took the tie rod nut off, turned it upside down, and just a little bit less than flush with the uh, stud sticking up there. Smacked it with a hammer, broke it loose. See right there. So now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and take it the rest of the way off, and I'm gonna zip tie it up to here somewhere. Probably zip tie it up to the drag link or the sway bar that I'm not even using anymore. And here comes in more comments. No, I don't use my sway bars. I don't have a track bar either. As a matter of fact, I disconnected that years ago to go wheeling and I've never tied it back up again because you see I've got the quick disconnects where the pin goes right here and right there and it drove just fine without it. So it's just been hanging there for like several years. I need to just go ahead and take it off and get it out of the way. And as you guys can see, looky ma, no track bar. Don't need them. Don't need them. It drives just fine. Highway and all. I used to go back and forth to Little Rock, Arkansas from Nashville, and that's like a six-hour drive running highway speeds. No issues, people. Tied up and out of the way. Now I got full open access to take out my gears and put them back in. And take them out. You know, got size up the gyms. Now to make it easier to get the yoke out, you put the yoke tool in place here, bolt here, bolt here, using the bolts for that came with the straps, the holds you join their thing in place, and I just used a quarter inch washer right here because the uh, bolt heads will go through the little slots right there. You only need two of them, just snug them down, you ain't gotta make them crazy tight. Then take your breaker bar, pop it in there, let it rest against your leaf. So when you take your other breaker bar, put it inside there to break it loose, this will hold everything in place. Use an inch and one eighth inch socket on the pinion nut, long breaker bar or impact if you wanna go that route. And break that sucker loose. And once you get the pinion nut off, sometimes you can get hold of them and pull them right off. Sometimes you gotta give a little love persuasion. Sometimes you gotta give a little tapping. Sometimes you need a bigger hammer. I'll be right back. Ta-da! Sometimes you give it a little love tap. Sometimes you gotta knock the bottom out of it to get the job done. And now go ahead and pull your ring pin and your carrier out. Now just remember when you pull the carrier, your caps, there's a J here, J here, a J here, and a J here. The difference is this J goes like this, long leg goes this way. This J goes this way, long leg that way. This shade's upside down, this shade's upside down. The caps have to go back in the same position. We get you close up. See the J there? See the J there? That cap has to match that one right there. So make sure they go on the same side and this end goes down over here. J there, J there. Again, this cap goes in this side, pointing down this way. Now it's very possible that 
your caps and your differential will not be marked. That is a possibility because sometimes, well, that's just the case. And I can hear it now. Oh my gosh, what do I do? They're not marked. Oh, I'm so confused. Relax, people. Some of y'all get so uptight. It's easy fix. If you do not have any marks indicating which cap goes to which side and which end needs to go down, super easy fix. Ta da! Center punch. Take this side, this cap, find you a place. We'll just go right here for the heck of it. It don't matter where. One, and what I'm doing, this like spring loaded. I'm pushing, and it's gonna make a little divot in the end of that cap right there. Little tiny spot right there. Not very deep at all, because you don't need a lot. Okay, I've got one here, so come over here. One, two, if you feel frog, you can do a three. Why not? One mark there, one mark there. This mark is on this, the bottom side of the cap. Align these two marks right here, and guess what? Your cap is lined up. So what do you do over here? Do one, two, one, two. Mark there, right side up, number two. Come over here on the flange. There you go. I've got one little dent there, one dent there on this end of the cap. That tells me the cap goes down and lines with this one right here. One, one, two, two. Again, those dents are on the bottom side of the cap. The dents here are on the bottom side of your gasket surface. Two, two. Line them up, you're good to go. See, y'all chill, relax. It's all good. Now, when you get ready to pull this carrier, and I, I pull this cap off, it's possible that carrier's gonna wanna fall out, so just be ready for that. The little Dana 30s are so small, small, they're not very heavy to begin with. If you're pulling a Dana 60 or a 14 bolt, Get ready for a little bit of heft. And when you pull it, your rain, your uh, race right here, it's gonna want to come out with it. They may fall out, go everywhere. So slide on out. Da da. There we go. Now I'm gonna set this over here on top of my oil catcher a new come on dirty now we gotta get that thing out of there Whee! a little loose and sloppy isn't it so the pinion's ready to come out now what you didn't see me do off off camera on the other side where the pinion nut is over here on that side I tapped it with a hammer just enough to break it loose from the bearing races and then she slides right out and be careful because you've got these and up in here we got more of them see and you want to keep track of those because you may end up reusing them yeah, I think it's all of them now there's a bearing right there and the grease seal on the other side of that so we're going to tap those out oh see oh oh, oh. got another shim and you don't want to bend if you keep from it but if you notice the shims that I just took out they got a little bit of a, I guess you might call warpage to them, but they're like that from the factory. Some of them are flat. Your really thin ones can be bent a little bit, but your thicker ones, they're flat, so you don't want to bend them and booger them up. So, anyway, I'm going to go pull that seal on the other side. Big old pry bar behind the seal. Pop that baby out of there. Here's your oil slinger, and I'm making a mess. I'll have to lay in. Put my rag right there. Put the bearing over a lot catch can. 
Now we'll get inside there and knock out that race right there. So what you want to do is get you a punch or something like that. You want to come in from the gear side of the differential and get on the back side of that bearing race and knock it out this way. I just got a piece of junk flat stock right here, so I'm going to go on the other side right there. Let it hook the back side of the bearing race and I'll tap it with a hammer and walk that race out of there. Oh. Now looking from the gear side, looking from the gear side, looking through this way toward the back of the Jeep, you can see part of that lip right there. What I was doing is hanging the end of that bar stock right on the very edge of that lip. I tap this side a little bit, tap this side a little bit, just kind of working its way around. So go like uh, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, then 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and just keep working around positions like that. And what it does, it just kind of wiggles it right out of the seat up inside the differential. Easy peasy. Now we got to get that inner shield right there out in that race. So I'll go from the other side. Beat them this way. So go, go. So look. There she goes. Okay, so what you want to do now is get up inside here, clean this up. Look, make sure there's no other shims left up in here because, right, let me get them. That bearing race had these two shims behind it. They were like sitting right against it, right? They were kind of like sitting against it right here, along with this washer here. So it's a combination thickness of this plus two shims that was behind that bearing race. But we'll get into that when we do the reinstall. And here's my other shims. You want to keep track of all this because you may have to reuse them. That'll just come about whenever you start putting everything back together. So I'm going to get my brake clean. I'm going to get it clean everything out real good. And I've got a seal right here. And I've got one down that way, down the axle tube this way. Not right here, but down the seal that way for my where the CAD is. The vacuum actuating collar thingy. Okay, I'm going to set myself up for all you keyboard warriors to start just totally, you know, giving me a lot of slack here. I'm not changing these seals. Why? Because they're not leaking. The whole time I've had this front axle in this Jeep, I've never had an oil leak any shape, form, or fashion. I want this axle back together because I want to get out and go play, go wheel and all that stuff. So, the next, these have never leaked, and if they do, it's not that hard to change them. Because all your shims and stuff are captured inside where the bearings are. Your bearing cups go right here. Uh, let's see, we get this one right here. Your bearings are sitting in here like this right here. Your bearing races. Inside here is where your taper bearing sits. In between the taper bearing and the carrier, as I'll show you here. There's the taper barrier. Inside that is your shims. So, whenever you pull this whole carrier out and you need to change that seal, you're not going to disrupt your 
clearances. Once you get everything set, you're good to go. Your pinion, if you have to change your seals right here, your pinion does not have to come back out. And the shims for your pinion is actually captured right along in here. So you don't have to pull your uh, pinion out to change these seals. So you're not going to disrupt anything. I could put another hour into changing out these uh, seals right here for no good reason because they don't leak, or at least mine aren't. And if they ever do leak, hey, there's you another video. So if y'all want to get all whiny, cry, and blast me in the comments, have fun with it. I don't care. Because apparently somebody's put new seals in this axle before because, yeah, look at that. That's RTV. Why they did that, I have no idea. But I guess they weren't sure it didn't leak. Now here's how this works. There's your new axle seal. Right notice this step right here this lip actually goes up inside there and this right here goes around your axle to you know squeeze against the axle keep the grease from coming out this contraption right here which is part of a kit that the rest of us hiding over here that we'll show you in just a moment right there that lip right there on the inside this radius here fits against that and this right here all goes inside your differential this right here butts up against the other side and you take and this screw right here, this bolt or nut, whatever the heck it is, as you crank it, with this pressed against it, as you crank it, it presses this seal right here into place. So let's go down to the axle and I'll put all this contraption in place and I'll kind of give you guys a little bit of a demonstration on how that works. So need that, need that, need that. Now when you order that little kit, right there's where it all comes packaged up in. The installer kit, I mean. So what we're going to do is, this piece right, well, uh, actually you want this on here first, screw it way up back here. Then we take this, slide that down, because that acts as a spacer to go up recess up in here, because this right here is sized for different sized uh, pieces. So, yep, yeah, we're good. So that goes in there like that right there. Seat that against the inside lip of that seal. And from there, you'll just start turning that nut, pushing that tool that way, which will press your seal in place. Pretty easy. Now the seal for your CAD central axle disconnect is actually right inside here. That tool is not gonna work for that. So basically what you do is you just get you a big washer to fit that seal right there and put it on the inside of that seal and get you a piece of long th uh, all thread, go to the hardware store, whatever, a piece of all thread, you'll put a nut on one side and run it all the way through the axle. Oh, I need to break wall over here. And bring it out this side right here and put you a bigger washer right here to hold everything in place and you'll just tighten up that nut on that all thread. It'll pull the all thread this way and they'll press that seal in place. Now again, a lot of you guys want to see me replace those seals and I totally 100% understand. As a video creator that does this information for people that I really probably should to give you guys that great information. But here's the deal. I ain't gonna fix what ain't broke. I don't have no leaks on my axles or anything. If I ever do get a leak on my axles, I got the seals to replace them, I'll show you then. But if it ain't broke, I ain't gonna fix it right now. I want this thing back together so I'm not gonna spend the extra time of doing it. Uh, maybe, let's see, I'm trying to think of what other products I got coming up. I mean, Rust Bucket's getting a 14 bolt and Dana 44 front. So maybe if I build another Dana 30 one of these days, I'll change out that seals, or maybe one day I'll get Froggy changing for the fun of it. But it's not today. So I'm going to get my brake cleaner, get all that junk cleaned up on the inside, and we're going to start preparing to put it together. Oh, yeah, I just thought of another thing some of you keyboard warriors are going to bust me on. If I'm going to relieve that seal right there, that means I'm leaving my, my CAD in place, this central axle disconnect. It has a collar that locks the two uh, pieces of axle together. You are correct. I'm leaving it in place. Oh my gosh, we're about to have a heart attack out here. There's so many of you out there say, why don't you just go ahead and do the one piece axle conversion and get it over with it? And you know what? You're correct for the most part. But here's the deal. I'm a video creator. I do content to show you guys how to do stuff. And there's a lot of questions out there about running front lockers. Lockers, I mean, questions such as, is it loud? Does it click a lot? Does it, does it drive bad when it's icy and snowing outside? Here's the deal. 
I'm going to put it in one of those PosiLock systems that has the uh, cable system that slides that collar back and forth so I can select whether I want that locker engaged or not. That phrase I just said is a little bit misleading. I don't technically, un I don't technically unlock the locker because it's a lunchbox locker and it stays locked all the time. But what I do is separate those two axles and allow it to slide, which makes the locker not needed. I guess that's what I'm looking for. By that happening like that, I can go out and do videos showing, okay, it's nice and icy outside because I'm in Tennessee. We don't get a whole lot of snow, but we do get ice. And so that's when it's going to drive the worst, according to a lot of the internet lore, that when it's icy outside, it drives terrible with the front end locked in like it. So what I can do is I can unlock my front axle and show you guys like, look, it drives great with the rear wheels, you know, just rear wheels pulling. And it's got a 8.8 .8 limited slip under the back of it. Then I can lock the front end back in place, say, okay, now look, it's pushing, it's doing this, it's doing that, all that weird stuff that lockers may do. I can do those type of demonstrations by having a selectable setup in my front axle. So once I do all those videos and what a locker does, what a locker doesn't do, blah, 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 blah. Once I do all those, then at that point, if I want to convert to a one piece axle, that'll make a good video for you guys later. And then I can change those seals out. Okay, cool. So don't get all crazy in the comments. I have told you, I'll let you know what I'm gonna do. Let's roll. So what we're gonna do now is create a setup nut for your pinion. Here's the nut that came with the new kit. Notice right there, right there, and right there, they crimp the nut down like this so it squeezes on the thread of the pinion bearing, a pinion gear. You want to take this right here off time or two, simply because you've got to set your pinion preload for your bearings. So you're gonna tighten this sucker up, get your little uh, torque wrench. Okay, I'm running inch pounds, inch pounds. We're gonna get to that numbers later. Either you're gonna be too tight or too loose. So you want to add and remove shims a time or two till you get everything set right. Well, that being said, if you take this thing here on and off too many times, it becomes the lock nut feature, becomes loose and it doesn't do its job. So we gotta create a locking, a setup locking nut or setup nut, whatever. So we're gonna keep this one. This is the one that come with the kit. I went and bought this one at the local O'Reilly's. Part number right there, 714A961, pinion nut for Dana 30. Again, same scenario. Squeezed in here, here, and here. Put it on the pinion gear and you can see it a little bit better. See where it's squeezed in? We're gonna take grinding rock, open all that up until that nut goes on and off this thing freely by hand. So whenever we go to uh, you know, set our pinion preload, we're not boogering up the threads until we need to set permanently. Hope it made any kind of sense. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in a pair of grips here, locking pliers so I don't rip my hands apart, and keep this right rock in there and keep grinding that open until I can take this screw on and off here by hand. I'm not gonna bore you guys to death with that, but I'll just kinda give you guys a quick demo and then we'll get in here and keep working it and working it until we finally get it to screw onto the pinion gear by hand. So, there you go. Have fun with that. Okay, after a little bit of time and grinding, this and that, we got a setup nut. Yay. So now I'll get you some brake cleaner, clear all the junk out of there, make it all nice and clean. So we're good to go. All right, screw. Hope you guys enjoyed that video because our next video is going to be setting up the backlash, setting up the preload, and all that kind of fun stuff to install the ring and pinion gears. Then my gear ratios will actually match between my front and rear diff. I can put my drive shaft in and I can go wheeling. Yeah. Now, the gears I'm putting there are 373s, and that's to match my 8.8 I have in the rear. The 8.8 has a limited slip, the front now has a lunchbox locker. Now, why am I going 373s? Well, my front ratio was four, was a um, my front ratio is with 355s, so at least I go with 373s a little bit deeper gears. Now, would it have been better to go like 413s or 456, something like that, for off-roading? It absolutely would be. But this rig right here is pretty much still a driver, even though I've got my hole back here in the back. Uh, I still like driving this rig, so it's still going to be highway sane. This isn't, isn't going to get the hardcore trails or anything, rust buckets for that. And as soon as I get the junk off my trailer, I'm going after my, I've got a 14 bolt and a Dana 44 that's going under rust bucket. It's getting the deep gears, it's getting all the fun stuff. It's actually, I've got two transfer cases for it, so the rust bucket will be getting a doubler set up. 
So rust bucket gets all the fun stuff. This right here is going to still stay kind of highway sane and it'll still get the lightweight trails. So if you guys like those types of videos, be sure to hit that subscribe. Give me some cool comments down below and appreciate you hanging out. Peace. Later y'all.